Hello and welcome back, second part of the Lee Jig series and today we're going to look at box joints on the Lee Jig. If that sounds interesting, stick around. So this is the second video in a series about the Lee DR4 Pro dovetail jig. And if you remember, in the first episode, we looked at the setup of the jig and some of the basic features. Today, we're going to look at using the jig in anger to make some box joints. Now, throughout this series, we're going to be making a small medical cabinet for the workshop. Now, although this is not a project build about a medical box, I do need one in the workshop. So I've decided to design one around the ability of the Lee DR4 Pro jig and we'll have something useful at the end. Multi-part series, and in this episode, as I say, we look at the box joints. Next one, we look at sliding dovetails. The one after, we'll then look at the dovetails, through dovetails, and blind dovetails, and then we'll have something of value. We need to start by designing the project. So the things I want to put inside my medical kit, I want a couple of bottles of Eye wash. I think things in your eye is the most frequent accident inside a workshop, even if it's only small dust particles. I favour these eye wash bottles with the eye cup on top. That makes it very easy to rinse and treat your eye when you're by yourself in the workshop. I want to have a number of adhesive wound dressings for larger problems. A whole variety of plasters, all shapes and sizes. Some medical wipes and a pair of tweezers for splinters. I also want a number of bandages just in case I need to treat anything more severe that will require secondary aid. We're going to build a box to hold that medical kit that goes on the wall and here's a very 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 simple diagram. It's obviously going to be an outside frame with partitions in the middle. There's going to be an open space here that will take the two eye wash bottles. There's going to be individual compartments for the three bandages, a drawer at the bottom here that will obviously pull out and inside there we'll have our plasters, our adhesive wound dressings, our tweezers and our sterile wipes. We'll probably make a raised panel door to go on the front and a matching drawer front but we'll worry about that when we get there. And in terms of joinery, for no apparent reason than using the Lee jig, all the outside frame is going to be in box joints or finger joints. All the internal partitions will all be in sliding dovetails. The drawer will have blind dovetails at the front and through dovetails at the back. And by doing that, we will use every single capability of the Lee jig as it comes out of the box. So let's work on some sizes. Okay. So we now know the layout, and the layout is going to be something like this inside the box. Now this is looking down on the drawer unit, so obviously these will be more like this. So what I want to find out is the overall width of the unit. If I look at the widest internal dimension I need, that is really going to be the contents of the draw unit. So round about 220 is going to be good. I'm using 18mm pine, that's scrap material that I've got round the shop from when we did the bookcase build. That's obviously over engineered for this job, but while we've got it, we'll use it. So 18mm on either side is 36, so 220 plus 36 is 25 Eight. So I'm looking for an external width of 258 millimetres. Now we're going to use something known as the golden ratio to work out the height of the cabinet. And although it's quite a complicated formula, we can simplify it by remembering 1.6. So if we multiply 258 by 1.6, that will give me a height. Now that height, coupled with our width of 258, gives you a very pleasing shape on the eye. And we're not going to do design principles in this video, but I will do a design video at some point and we'll talk about those different type of ratios you can get and why you want to incorporate them in your work. But for today, just multiply that by 1.6 and we'll see if that height will work. 258 multiplied by 1.6 is going to equal 412.8. So 412.8. So if we take 36 millimeters away from that 412.8, that will give me the internal dimensions of this cabinet. So 412.8 minus 36 equals 
376.8 millimeters. 376.8 millimeters takes me to round about there. So that's pretty good because remember these are actually on their side so that's going to give me quite a lot of depth for storing multiple versions of this and it gives me a nice pleasing ratio. So we're going to go with 412.8. Our eye is never going to notice that 0.8 so we'll round it up and we'll go for a height of 413 millimeters. Now the one dimension we don't have now is how deep this box needs to be. Obviously the box has got to be as deep as the widest thing we want to store and in that case that's our adhesive wound dressing. This is going to be on its side inside the drawer so that's the overall length and we'll give that 120 millimeters. So we want this to be 120 millimeters plus 18 millimeters for the front face of the drawer and 18 millimeters for the back of the drawer and also we need to put a back on this which is likely to be 12 millimeter pine so we'll go for something like that 120 plus 18 plus 18 plus 12 is 168 so we want the thickness of our cabinet to be one six eight so with those three dimensions we've got the height we've got the width and we've got the depth now the internal partitions will work out on that part of the job no reason to do that now we know we've got enough room to maneuver inside the cabinet so let's crack on and look at the box joints now in order to use the jig you're going to have to make yourself a spacing board now there are dimensions for this recommended dimensions inside the book but the important thing to remember are it's got to fit into the jig this is the 24 inch jig meaning it's got a 24 inch capacity between the end stops here on the left and the end stops here on the right that's about 609 millimeters in metric we know we've got a depth of the box of 168 millimeters thereabouts so we know that the width of the boards we're going to use is going to be 168 millimeters so as long as your board is longer than 168 and fits inside the jig you're in good shape you want to make sure that your reference end the end of the board you're going to slide up to these two stops here is square to the material that's going to come to the end here so make sure that's square and in our case unsurprisingly it is so we're in good shape so that goes into place there to line up the back piece of material slot in a board doesn't matter what size align it to the end stops and just clamp that into position like so then slide this board to the front and you want this front edge of the board to be flush against the back of this and the end of this to be resting against those two joints so round about there is absolutely perfect now if you do it in that configuration as you're cutting your box joints your outer bit will cut into this back piece of wood and therefore avoid tear out on the back of your joint not essential but a good tip now the information about the box joint starts on chapter 15 which is page 53 of our manual now if you flick over to page 55 and look at paragraph 15.2 it will tell you that you need to use your finger assembly on the support brackets in the half blind tails mode which is this symbol here. So you want that symbol, the one on the green scale, facing upwards and to your left and you slot that into position like so. If you remember when we did the setup we spoke about these small marks here on the arms that's a position mark and you want to line that position up to this little black arrow on your green scale and similarly there's a mark here on this arm and you want to align that to that little black mark there and then you can lock that into position and you don't need to move this again for box 
joints. Now the difference with box joints and dovetail joints on the DR4 Pro is that the dovetail joints are infinitely variable. Now what that means is for dovetails you can set these fingers pretty much where you want to to suit the width of your material and also the design that you want to go for. It's not the same with box joints. Box joints or finger joints are set so you've got to change the width of your material to suit the pattern of the fingers. Now you can get around that a little bit by buying additional finger templates for the DR4 Pro but that's obviously an additional investment and you're still constrained by the pattern and the dimensions of those fingers. So we've got to compromise a little bit here in that depth of the box. Although we liked 168, in reality we can't use that. Let me show you why. Now this is just a scrap piece of pine, doesn't matter what length it is. And I'm just going to make a mark at 168, which is there. And I'll just square that across with a black pen so you can see it. So this, in theory, would be the width of the board that we would want to use on our project. Now the way that we set this up, lower the fingers so they are resting on that backing board that you just put into place. Small bit of pressure to make sure it's flat and just lock that down on both ends. Then bring in your board with a square reference edge against the indents on the jig and slide that up until it touches the fingers. Then release the knobs and just bring that up so it's just ever so slightly clear of the backing board and lock it into position and that's just going to make it easy for you to slide the fingers as you adjust them. Take your first finger and you want to slide that until the outside edge of the finger here is round about one millimeter from that end. So that's going to be round about there and then just lock that into place. You're now looking for this black piece of plastic. Two of these came in the kit and if you look at them, as well as being a different size, you can see that this one has a dovetail shape in it and this one has a square shape in it. Obviously we're not using the dovetail one, we're using the square one. You start by overlapping this finger with the number one. You take your second finger and you slide it up to the template. Hold that firmly against and then lock that into place. And then you should be able to take this out with some resistance, but it shouldn't be too tight. You then take the number two and you hold that against the fingers in that orientation and you bring this one up and you clamp that into place. And you repeat this down your fingers. Now as you get to this mark here, you can see my finger is now quite a distance away from the outside of the mark. Don't forget that's in super black pen and actually it's about there that our mark was. So I've now got a one millimeter gap at this end and what is looking like, I'm going to suggest a two millimeter gap at this end. Now when we cut this, it's going to be cutting into each of these spaces and that's going to give us a number of fingers and a couple of half fingers at the end. We then offset the board and we cut the appropriate sockets for this. So therefore these two fingers on the outside have to be the same otherwise when we offset it it doesn't fit and the lead jig depends on these being lined up accurately in order for this to actually work. So with this being two millimeters out this joint is not likely to work. And if you look on page 54 of the user guide you see these two tables. One table here is in inches and one table here is in millimeters. You'll also see there's a 3 8 inch and a 3 quarter inch or a 9.5 millimeter and a 19 millimeters. That's showing you the thickness of the finger joints you're going to make. In a 9.5 millimeter each of your finger joints are going to be 9.5 millimeters in thickness and on the 19 millimeter cut each is going to be 19 millimeters in thickness. So all out of the box on the Lee DR4 Pro, we can create both 9.5 millimeter thick fingers and 19 millimeter thick fingers, which is great. And everything you need to do that comes with the kit. We've not spent any additional 
money. Now, because that's set at nine and a half millimeters and 19 millimeters, and because of the way this works, everything has got to line up, you have to vary the width of your stock, which could be considered as a limitation that the jig is now dictating the width of the stock and not our design requirements. In an ideal world, I want 168 millimeters. And if I come down my table, the nearest I have is 167 millimeters. So I now have to make a design choice. Do I want to make my material 167 millimeters wide or do I want to step up to 186 millimeter wide? Well, in our case, I'm going to step down to the 167 millimeters because that's going to be near enough and it's not that critical. So I'm going to cut all my stock at 167 millimeters. So my next job is I'm going to cut out these four pieces, two sides, a top and a bottom. So that's it. Everything's cut to size, two sides, a top and a bottom. Everything's square, everything's exactly the same width, and if you can see, I've marked up the piece of wood with a reference edge. Marked it on both sides. This is the edge we're going to reference on the jig, and it's the same edge I used to reference this on the MFT when I did the square cuts. I've also created two bits of scrap wood, 18 millimeter pine again, exactly the same width as the stock we're using for the box, also squared with a reference edge marked. We're now going to make a test cut on these scrap pieces. That's the final part of setup that we need to do on the jig. I've also dropped the router bit into the router and I've set the variable bush, the E7 variable bush, to five on that mark that we made during the setup. And if you remember, this is not a round cam, it's wider in this dimension than it is in this dimension, and we'll use that feature to tighten or loosen the joint once we've done a test fit on the material. I'm now gonna take one of our scrap pieces of wood and I'm going to reference the edge here to the two indents on the side of the jig here we've obviously got our backer board in the jig and the fingers are all set to the appropriate spacing and everything is tightened down the fingers are now resting on the backer board and everything's tight i can now come in with my scrap piece of wood reference edge to these indents on the jig and I want to slide this material up until it's resting on the bottom of the fingers here and at that point I can lock it into place using the cams. Now you know this is looking good when the piece that you're about to route is square and flush to the backer board and everything is at the same level. That shows a good indication that everything is going to be square. The next thing we need to do is to set the depth of cut of this router bit. To do that you take a piece of stock the same distance and you just draw a line underneath like so. Now you just plunge down the router and you're looking for the bit just to cut that line ever so slightly which is going to be about there and then lock it in. That is now set for the appropriate depth. Now the book here is a little bit misleading. It talks about routing through and keeping the bush onto these fingers down this edge here and routing round in this profile. What you'll find if you do that, when your router's coming down on these fingers here onto this stroke, it's going to blow out the edge of this material and that makes a very ugly joint. So what you want to do instead is to route in that direction against this finger and when the bush hits this part here or this part here, bring it straight back out resting against this finger. Then move it over and then route that. So your routing operation is going to be straight down, stop, straight back, move across away from the cut, straight down, straight back. Then find the next cut and repeat it. And if you do that, you'll find that you won't get a blowout or tear out on the front of these 
fingers. With that said, let's go ahead and make the first series of cuts. Now, I'm not going to use the dust collector here on the first set of cuts. Two reasons for that. I want you to be able to see the action of the router as we go in, come back, move across and go in. And I also want you to see the amount of dust that's going to come off this without the dust collector. On the next piece of wood, we'll actually put this into place and you can see the difference that the VRS makes. Then you can make the decision, is this something you want to invest in? And I think I know the answer to that question already. But enough talking, let's crack on and make these cuts. Now I hope you saw how much dust was coming off this and just one look at my shirt shows you how much dust we've collected and that's the last time I do it that way. Now hopefully you can see here that these are really nice and pristine, there's no tear out, everything is nice and square and it's all looking pretty good. So the next job is we now need to route the sockets. Again my reference edge is going to go to the side but this time I'm going to use this black adapter to offset it. Number three at the front. These teeth simply clip into this groove here and you push it to the edge nice and firm like that. Then you take your second piece of wood and this time we're pushing up to this edge here on the plastic adapter that will offset this piece of wood. Again, bring it up to the fingers, make sure it's flat and clamp that into position. You can see it's offset pretty much by a finger, so you can see how this is going to come together. Now, look at this board, look at our backer board. This is where we cut into that backer board. If you now route directly through, there is nothing supporting the back edge of this material, and that's going to give you a blowout on the back of your board. So you now want to turn this board around. Maintain the same reference edge, but just turn it over. Bring it up so it's flush to your board and clamp that into position. Lower the fingers so they're flat onto the back of the board and tighten everything down. Now just check yourself to make sure that there's no gaps between the backs here and everything is nice and flush, and it is. This time we're going to drop on the dust guard and we'll see the difference that, that makes in the dust collection. So now we just need to assess the joint. Rather than fighting this, the easiest way to do it, just take a few fingers at the end and just bring it together like so. Knock it into place. And see what it looks like. So if anything, this joint's a little bit too loose. You can see the slight gaps around this here. Lengthwise, we probably could do with going down a little bit further in terms of the depth and I want to make these joints a little bit tighter. So, if you look at this on the bottom, it says here heighten in this direction and loosen in this direction. So I'm just going to turn this round by one mark to number six. That's going to tighten this up by 0.05 millimeters. I've put a new backer board in place, just turn that over. I've adjusted the depth of this ever so slightly. I've taken out my offset clamp and I'm going to come back in and route the next set of fingers. So 
So I've cleared the jig away so we can have a look at this joint that we have just created. Now at first glance it looks okay, but let's get really, really critical. Can you see these gaps here on these fingers? So some of these fingers are fitting really nice and tightly, such as these two here. Other ones have gaps here on this side. There's some gaps over here on this side as well. Look at this part of the joint. We've got a little bit of tear out on the fingers. And again, we've got some gaps. And again, there's some tear out here and here. So although the joint looks reasonably good, closer inspection tells me it's not good enough yet for our final project. In the back of the manual, chapter 17, I'm starting on page 65, there is a hints and tips section. And this talks about the problem of tear out. And in here it's recommending a few solutions that we can apply to improve the quality of the joint. The first one is talking about climb routing. Now we've actually used climb routing. If you remember, we went down one finger, we came back, we moved over and routed down the next side of the finger. That in effect is climb routing. So we tried that technique and that did indeed reduce tear out. It talks about using a score so we can use a marking gauge to actually sever the fibers and that also tops some of that tear out. And more interestingly, it talks about the use of backer boards. So you're actually sandwiching the piece of wood between two other pieces of wood and then routing that out and that eliminates tear out completely. So that's it for today. In the next episode, we're going to look at some of those recommended coping techniques to see if we can improve the quality of this joint before we go ahead with the final piece of work. And in that video, I also want to talk about the e-bush, that elliptical variable bush, because I think there's a design flaw in that that's giving me gaps in my joints. So we'll explore that in the next video. Hope you find this useful. See you soon.